Today, guys, we have Ken Harrison. He is the chair of Promise Keepers and the CEO of Waterstone Foundation coming to us from Colorado Springs, Colorado. In the midst of this series on stewarding the awakening, we're going to talk to Ken, who's an entrepreneur, former police officer, a minister of ministers, been in leadership within the body of Christ for decades about the unity of the body of Christ and the importance of us laying down our egos and coming to Jesus together. You're going to be really blessed by this conversation with Ken Harrison as we dissect how to steward a great awakening. Welcome to the Conversations with Christians Engaged podcast. I'm your host, Bunny Pounds, the president of Christians Engaged. This ministry exists to awaken, motivate, educate, and empower ordinary believers in Jesus Christ to do three things. To pray for our elected officials and our nation regularly. To vote in every election to impact our culture and to engage in some form of civic education or involvement for the well-being of our nation. So thankful, Bunny, for what you do. A lot of people talk the talk, but you really walk the walk. There's nobody else I want to talk to about Jesus with than you. And I will stand and lock arms with this woman of God, Bunny Pounds, any day of the week. Uh, Bunny, you are a a new hero of mine. And I'm 100% behind something that Bunny Pounds is doing. Encourage her, pray for her, and be involved. Be part of Christians actively engaged. America is worth it. Now is the time. America needs your involvement. Please take our pledge to pray, vote, and engage. Join with a movement of other Christians that are doing these three simple things that can really impact this nation. Join us. Guys, Bunny Pounds here with another conversation with Christians Engaged. We are in the middle of a series right now that I absolutely love. We're talking about stewarding an awakening. I know we are all praying. We're praying for God to move in this nation. Man, we need God to move in this nation. But the reality is awakening has many components to it. There's a hunger for the word of God. There's a hunger for repentance. There's a hunger in the unity of the body. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk to Ken Harrison, who who I've already introduced in the introduction, um, the CEO of Promise Keepers and Waterstone Foundation. Uh, Ken, I am so excited to talk to you about the body of Christ. You've seen so much within the body. How are you, brother? I'm good. I'm good. How are how are things in Texas? Texas is great, and uh, we're we're excited to just keep the republic alive here in Texas and get more <laughs> yeah, Christians. I might have to move down there pretty soon if we keep going the way we are. Yeah, come on, move from California. Come on. Well, you guys don't have good mountains there, though. That's the problem. <laughs> it is true. We do not have the great scenery that y'all have there. Well, I'm super excited to talk to you because you were put over as the chair of Promise Keepers. Um, and then also you work as the CEO of Waterstone Foundation, which is an amazing donor advice fund for Christians all over the country that want to fund kingdom causes. But you have a unique perspective, Ken, and that you've seen the body of Christ in so many different um, places come together in unity. And I want to talk to you first about, you know, what have you seen in Christian ministry as it relates to awakenings or revivals that you've held on to in your own heart and thought, wow, I would love to see that again. Yeah, you know, I'm a, a major fan of history and and I love to read church history, biblical history. And when you look at the great awakening that occurred, George Whitfield came to the United States and he linked up with Jonathan Edwards. And, you know, that that awakening was so massive that it, it literally it, it happened in 1740. And it informed what became the Constitution of the United States, you know, 40 years later. But at that time, when we had the Great Awakening, the out of wedlock birth rate was 39% in 1739. And that's what it is today, 39%. Um, And there's a level of desperation in America back in those days. America was not a moral place. Alcoholism, child abuse was rampant. And what we think of as America really was after the Great Awakening. What, what I've seen is that revival comes from desperation, and that's what we better be careful about. We do pray for, for revival, and, and I do, but it's when people give up their comfort, when they're, when they're 
um, daily grind of ignoring Christ comes into play and they have to desperately go after him. Cause you know, I hear people all the time, Christians say, well, you know, I'm trusting the Lord. It's just going to happen. Well, okay. Hang on. Um, I remember Israel when Babylon was around it and people were eating dead bodies in order to get enough nutrition. Is that what you mean? Because what God said was turn, 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 repent, repent, repent. And they refused. And that's where they ended up. And today we see in America, trust God. And yeah, well, what did God say? He said, repent. He said, repent. And it says, and I think it's Isaiah 66, 5. It says, and on whom will I show my favor? On someone who is humble, who is submissive in spirit, and who trembles up my word. So right now what I see is a lot of Christians in America, but not a lot of people who are trembling at the word of God. There's a lot of people who say, well, that's interesting the Bible says that. Now let's try to find a way to, to get around that. And so a roundabout answer to your question, I do think we need revival. But revival is going to come through repentance or it's going to come through desperation. And the question is, which way are we going to which way are we going to get it? That's a really good point. And what I've seen, and you're probably seeing this, too, is the Bible believing churches, the Christians that are going back to the foundations of what the word says and standing firm on that um, in the middle of what you know, I would call some sort of suffering or persecution. Right. And maybe not what we see in the Middle East or with Muslim believers coming to faith, but. Uh, you know, we're getting canceled. We're getting uh, told that we can't do things um, because of our Bible believing beliefs, but it unifies the body of Christ, I think, in a unique way. Um, how have you seen because you were uh, around even during the 90s when Promise Keepers, you know, led all the men uh, to the National Mall? What are you seeing when Christians lay down their differences, some of their little doctrines and go, you know what, we're going to bind together in a time for the purpose of repentance and revival? Well, you know, at the fall of mankind, we were given the choice. We were given the choice of, of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or eating from the tree of life. And what we did was we chose knowledge over life. Because Adam and Eve hadn't eaten from either tree yet. And for some reason, they hadn't yet eaten from the tree of life. That's why God says we got to hurry up and get them away from that tree. If they eat that, they'll be going to be stuck in their sin for eternity. Would be, that would be like hell on earth. So we, we now have a tendency always to go after knowledge, which is why salvation comes by faith. Because we have to turn from our need to know that, that original thing of the fall and say, I don't know. The only thing I know is what scripture tells me. For sure. Right. I mean, I have instincts and truths that we all learn, but we as a body of Christ with our different experiences can come together and add to the knowledge, share best practices and all that stuff. But but our core of, is scripture. It's God's word. Now, you see all these denominations and divisions and they come from lots of things. <clears throat> Some come from people's insistence of knowing. <clears throat> Excuse me. It comes from their insistence of knowing others. It comes from ego. It comes from their own power whatever. I am seeing some of that giving up of things, but I honestly, Bunny, and this is a tough truth for a lot of people, I, I think the megachurch movement has not been good for the evangelical um, church, and I think some of that's going to have to come to an end, that these churches that are massive, and they're not all bad, some of them are great. So one of the best friends to Promise Keepers has been Gateway Church there in, in Dallas. But but I do think, for the most part, this that the body of Christ is supposed to meet on the first day of the week. And the first day of the week is Saturday night. So when you read the Bible, we we have the moon calendar in Israel, they would go through the Sabbath. And when the Sabbath was over, when the sun went down, everybody would, everyone would come together in somebody's home on Saturday night. That was the church. And they would eat dinner. And this is why Paul tells them, hey, when you're taking communion, this isn't a party. You need, this is a holy moment in, in I think it's 1 Corinthians. But We've lost that. And now we have people who are coming in nameless and faceless into massive buildings with $150 million a year budgets, and they're getting entertained, and there's a business going on, and then they leave, and nobody knows anybody. That is not the church. That's just a group of people getting together for some religious thing. The church is having a relationship and discipling each other and being discipled and being humble and being under the authority of elders. And knowing who's hurting and who has whose kid has cancer and who lost their job and how can we step up and help you? That's the church. And we are so far from that in America. That's where we need to get back to if we really want to see people growing in Christ. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm preaching a little bit now, but, you know, people ask me all the time, are you a Christian nationalist? And I, I said, well, define that. 
what, what does that mean? Because the left loves to come up with boogie words and then they they throw out the boogie words and then they accuse you of being that and then no one's ever defined it. So the new thing is now Christian nationalists. You're a Christian nationalist. Well, if you mean do I want to see the United States be a Christian nation based on Christian values? Yes. But the idea would be how do we get there? And in your what you're inferring on the left is not you, you know, the proverbial left, is um, by force. No, we want to see America be a Christian nation by us going out and telling and evangelizing. And the mega church movement says, come and see, come and see, come and see our great music program and our fog machines and our skinny jeans and, and how we can conform to the world. That is never the message of scripture. The message of scripture is go and tell. So we need to get out of our buildings and go and tell the hurting world about the Lord Jesus Christ and then invite them into a relationship into our church where people are really know each other and care for each other. And that, if you want to see revival, that's revival. That is the awakening of the church. As long as we cling to a bunch of giant buildings with giant budgets and nameless and faceless people being entertained, we ain't going to see anything because that ain't Christ. Um. Wow. Can I 100% agree? You don't know that I'm. you're talking to a former house church movement pastor oh, for really? 10 years. <laughs> yes. So totally understand where you're at there. And uh, it, frankly, that's what we're trying to do with Christians Engage is wake Christians up and get them discipled in the word because there's nothing more important than us being authentic Christians and being leaders in our community. Um, and that really comes back to first century Christianity. And frankly, you're probably seeing this as I am, that the leaders that do go deeper with the body in homes or smaller churches or become leaders where they are teaching, preaching, discipling are the ones that end up being really bold and courageous in their communities because um, there's a depth. There's a depth of a well in God that might not be found in some of the other structures. Um, can you talk to me? Talk to us about maybe some things you've seen in leadership when God moves and there's the movement of the Holy Spirit or, you know, there's an awakening happening with young people, how sometimes egos get in the way or we start competing for control. Um, how do we let go and let God um, cause I think leaders right now need to be prepared. God is going to start moving again in a massive way, I believe. And the harvest is going to come in and it's got to be all of us together in the body, bringing that harvest in, not competing for our own ministries. You know, pride is CS Lewis said, it's not a sin. It's all of the sins put together. And, um, the world's father, the devil, that is the main sin that he's, He's got, and that's what he's so good at, at using in, in America and the church. Pride is the ultimate ugly thing because it says that I value myself more than I value you. You know, Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourself. So those are the, what we have. And I wrote in my book, um, Rise of the Servant Kings, what the Bible says about being a man. I wrote that humility is a sign of a person who's in love with Jesus. That is the thing. We have to stop tolerating ego um, in our leaders. Last week I had, I mean, I've been around a long time, as you know. Um, I was an LA cop and I ran huge businesses and promise keepers and Waterstone. I've seen a lot of stuff. Last week I had a, a thing that was really actually stunning to me. I had a pastor of one of the biggest churches in a certain city in my face yelling at me. I mean, literally, I I didn't know the guy. Uh, we were at a a, a leadership breakfast got over to me and just started yelling at me that um he hated promise keepers first because we were to take his men and we were taking his donors you're coming to my city and my men and my donors and me me i i and i was like wow that was like a demonic level of pride and his lips face was all angry and i mean promise keepers we, we run on a very low budget we're not after anybody's anything we're just trying to call men back to the lord jesus christ and it's, it's funny because some of this stuff, I'm like, you know, what is my responsibility to tell people about a pastor like that? You know, what is it? On the one hand, Jesus said, if you see your brother in sin, rebuke him. And if he asks for forgiveness, forgive him. Um, on the other hand, Proverbs says, correct a fool and he will hate you. Right. So mm -hmm. where where in that situation did, did it seem like a guy whom, with whom I have no relationship? Can I call and correct him and say, dude, that was some serious slander. And in the midst of saying that to me, he was also slandering every church leader that I possibly have known. He, this guy's terrible. That guy's terrible. He was just such a raving ego. Um, so I, I tend to keep those things to myself. I don't tend to run off and tell names and things because I, again, unity, 
and I have no relationship with him to try to correct him. I just found it to be sad. And I felt sad of how many, again, we, we said this a minute ago, but how many people have kids with cancer? How many people, how many men's wives just left them or they're suicidal or they're questioning their faith? How many of those people of tens of thousands are going to that guy's church and he's their example of what Christ is? And it just made me sad for all of them. So I pray and I try to um, really I'd mentor and disciple men in, in the Lord's word and talk about those things, the humility, a submissive spirit and trembling at the word of God. Those are the things that God will give us favor around. Yeah. So ego has hurt us tremendously. And it's again why I'm so, again, not against mega churches. I'm just against the megachurch movement because when you have such a massive budget and debt and buildings and real estate, it just necessarily starts to become a business. And you don't want to upset the big giver that gives you a couple of million dollars a year who's a big guy in town with the truth because you need that to make your mortgage payment. And so you start to compromise. And I'm just a big fan of little churches. My wife and I go to a little cowboy church here in Colorado. Um, music's terrible. Um, but it's just so it's so lovely it's so it's so beautifully terrible like they can't play more than two chords they can't carry a tune well sometimes we just break out laughing at just how bad the music is but they love jesus man and they're just poured out for the lord and the preaching is just solid and we sit in there and nobody knows who i am but uh, it's what a great church you know and and that to me that's the church and when I say nobody knows who I am, I mean, we have relationships there, but no one knows I run Problems Keepers. No one knows I run Waterstone. I just keep that to myself. But we just have all these relationships with people, and uh, that that should be where we're at. I love that, Ken, because that's really what the body of Christ is. <laughs> we're we're messy. We're <laughs> we're not perfect. And when we try to be perfect, it doesn't work out too well. It really, we come off to the world. I think like a plastic. Uh, Christians instead of real and um, Landers. yeah yeah um, <laughs> I used to like everybody knows me knows that I cry at a you know anything you know I, I start telling a story I've told it a hundred times and I'll start crying right and it used to bother me I mean I was running for Congress and I would just start tearing up I love you the people of the fifth congressional district and I'd start tearing up and I finally read a book from my friend Corey Russell wrote a book called the gift of tears and he was talking about really it's going to take vulnerable, transparent, real people that are not afraid to be, you know, out there with their emotions and not be afraid to cry that can break through the hardened hearts of man in this season. And I, I really uh, want to call people to that as well. Um, what is the dream of your heart, Ken? If you could just dream with me for a minute of for the body of Christ. You know, I, I sit around a lot of times and think about what I would love the body to look like, but I believe it's in God's heart. He wants to to purify his bride. He wants us to love him with all our heart, soul and mind and love our each other. Um, what do you when you think about the body and what you envision for men uh, of God or for women of God? What do you think about what is in the dream, the dream of God for his bride? You know, your friend and mine, James Robinson, often says um, that Jesus prayed to the Father that they would be one as we are one. And he wouldn't have prayed something that couldn't happen. And it's never happened yet. And so isn't it interesting? Um, we have a unique moment where we could actually be unified. And so my dream would be to see us unified around fear of the Lord. Because I see such a lack of that. And... I think Satan has really um, effectively redefined what love means. So you find that dishonest people change the, the meanings of words. That's what the left does all the time. Is changed, you know, obviously the most obvious one would be, you know, gay. Gay doesn't mean today what it meant 50 years ago. You know, when, when we watched Flintstones when we were little and they were going to have a gay old time, it meant something different than it would mean now. Well, the, 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 Satan has changed the meaning of the word love. So when we're supposed to love everybody, when I go in and talk about sin, I talk about repentance, that's my my thing when I preach. Um, when Jesus started his ministry, he came with a big horde of people. John the Baptist looked up at Jesus and all the people and said, you brood of vipers, who told you to flee the coming judgment? Repent and do works in accordance with repentance. Oh, hi, Jesus. This is you starting your ministry. I'm about repentance. So we need to be on, on hatred of sin and fearing the Lord. But when I see it, I see a... A, a church that properly understands and fears God in, a, in the way that we should. 
because of redefining the word love. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it's got a list of sins. Paul says, adulterers, idolaters, uh, the sexually immoral, homosexuals, um, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people will not see the kingdom of heaven. Well, if I'm a loving person, if I really love somebody and I know that they're verbally abusive, then it, the loving thing to do would be to go to that person and say, gee, I, I heard you screaming at your husband or your kids or your wife um, being verbally abusive. And here's what the Bible says. And, and maybe we need to come together and you and I gently walk through this without judgment and helping disciple you because I want to see you in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, by the way, doesn't mean heaven. It means a higher level of heaven. It's a long thing there. But um, if anybody wants to read on that, check out Jody Dillow's book, uh, Final Destiny, which is 1,200 pages, but worth reading. But back to back to this, um, what is love then? And we in America think love means being nice to everybody. Well, there's a lot of times when I really love my kids, but I wasn't very nice to my kids. When I spanked them, it wasn't nice. And when I grounded them and when I told them they couldn't have treats, that wasn't nice. But it was loving because I wanted to turn them into men and women who love Jesus Christ and had self-control, which they are now. So we need to get a hold of what love means as a church and remind, remember, it's not being nice to everybody. It's truly caring about their soul and what's good for their soul. So my dream would be a church that's unified around true, the meaning of love and a true respect, fear of the Lord. And we get rid of all of the stuff that we're not sure about. So you speak in tongues, you don't speak in tongues. You believe in eternal security, you don't. You believe in infant baptism, you don't. Whatever, man, it's not hills worth dying on. What's worth dying on is us truly loving each other and building each other up in Christ and taking care of each other's needs and pushing each other into a relationship with the, the Father who's most high. And maybe I'm wrong about speaking in tongues or not speaking in tongues, or maybe I'm wrong about Calvinism. Um, don't know. But those hills, let's get rid of those hills and let's come together around stuff that really, truly matters. The fearing the Lord and loving each other and, and trembling at the word of God. It's so good, Ken. And we're really seeing, um, I, I, I think for the first time in my Christian walk in ministry, really seeing John 17 even lived out in our little ministry with our board being very diverse, our staff being very diverse. We have Catholics, Protestants, you know, Bible Church, Baptists, Charismatics, we're all together. And it, yeah. it's, it's just, a, it's a miracle. And I, I sit around some days thinking, gosh, man, God, you're moving in ways I've, I could have only dreamed about. Um, I want to talk. The last question I have for you is you've seen people really step in um, through the work of Waterstone and really take resources, investing in something, pioneering something, growing something out of nothing and fill holes within the body of Christ. And I just want you to encourage people to to live the dream that God's put in their heart and to go after it. Uh, with everything they can. Um, can you can you just speak into that for a second of how God's using ordinary people, whether funding something or pioneering something to really shift things within the body of Christ? Yeah, so what Waterstone does is we're a foundation. Um, we give away about $3 million per week and that $3 million per week is don't, is directed by the people who the money comes through us and goes out. So I don't, I don't actually get to pick where it goes. Um, but... It's people taking complicated assets, essentially, and giving them away. So a person should never give away cash if they have any kind of wealth. And a, and a very simple example would be if somebody owns stock. So let's say you bought stock in, in Amazon for $10,000 uh, five years ago. Now it's worth $50,000. And you want to give money to your church. Well, if you if, let's say you want to give $10,000 to your church building fund. And what most people do is sell the stock. So if you sell that stock, you now have to pay capital gains on that stock. So now what was, depending on what state you're in, what was $10,000 is now $8,000 because you paid $2,000 in capital gains to the federal government plus to your state. If you live in a communist state like California, that's even more, right? If you, if you live in Texas, it's not so, it's just zero. Yes. But um. You, so you would you would sell the stock, you would pay the tax, and you would have $8,000 left to give to your church. If you donate that stock through Waterstone, you don't pay any capital gains. So you actually sell it for $10,000, and you still have $10,000 to give to your church, and you still get to write the $10,000 off your income taxes. So in the one way, you only had 8000 to give, and you only had $8,000 to write off. On the Waterstone way, you have 10000 to give and 10000 to write off. Now, complicate that by 
a hundredfold in companies and oil and gas wells and granaries. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff we help people take and turn that into giving. That's number one. Number two, what we do is help people give wisely because I'm telling Christians all the time, don't just be generous, be wise in your generosity. Because a lot of people are funding things that are not godly and they don't realize it. Um, we we just denied a grant. Somebody wanted to give a million dollars. It was a somebody, an heiress of a wealthy family. She wanted to give a million dollars to some nice people came along and told her about an anti-suicide group. And who wouldn't want to give to anti-suicide? But it was really a gay front group. Mm -hmm. So it was a homosexual activist group who called themselves anti-suicide. Um, and they were about to give a, a godly Christian woman was about to give them a bunch of money. And Waterston was able to step in, investigate and say, maybe, maybe not the best choice for you. And she thanked us profusely. We do that all the time. So we investigate and make sure that what people are giving. And Waterstone Fund, it takes uh, less than five minutes to open. Literally, oh, we're the, we're very, very big on service. You can just go online, waterstone.org, open up a fund. It's very simple. And you can put things in your fund. And the third thing it does is it protects your estate. So if you're wealthy or and you die and you have a state that goes into your donor advised fund here at Waterstone, and you said, gee, I, I want to make sure my money goes to these kinds of causes, we ensure that that money goes to what you wanted it to go to, even if your heirs maybe don't have the best biblical background that you did, which we see a lot, and they want to give to something that's pro-abortion. No, we make sure that that does not happen and that your money goes to where you wanted it to. So that's that's what we do at Waterstone. We help people to give more efficiently, pay less taxes, and more wisely by making sure that the people they're giving to are actually doing what they think they're doing. It's so good. I'm a huge fan of Waterstone and what you guys do, Ken. And and it's so important that people really watch out over their assets and their resources. And we even have a charity advice fund for Waterstone. So if someone wants to give us stock bonds property and you want to help Christians engage, we can help you do that through our account with Waterstone. So um, it's it's a wonderful way to make sure your resources are are used to the maximum benefit for the kingdom of God. Um, so thank you for all you do, Ken. As we close out today, I want to just encourage you guys. Remember, step one with Christians Engage is take the pledge to pray, vote, and engage. We are going to reach a million Christians by the end of the presidential year uh, with this pledge around the country in a very important state. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't taken the pledge to pray, vote, and engage, go on our website and do that. Get in our classes, our classes. We are becoming like the Leadership Institute for the Church and we just launched a campaign school uh, for Christians, and we're launching Christ, uh, Biblical Worldview also in June. So we've got more classes in development, but just know, guys, we have developed over $200,000 we spent on curriculum development for the body of Christ. So if you haven't taken one of our classes, they're just 29 bucks. Uh, start with on-ramp to civic engagement and then move forward with some of these other classes, Biblical Justice, Biblical biblical economics nehemiah and others and then reminder that my book's out yay jesus in politics keep that momentum going guys i really appreciate it um this book is changing people's lives i'm really shocked at the pastors and ministry leaders and young people that are reading the book and really seeing their place in the culture it's really a blessing and then lastly fund a movement right now um is critical time uh april may june of Christians Engage, we are doing a massive fundraising towards reaching a million Christians. We can't spend this money in September, October. We've got to spend it now. So uh, if you guys feel called to help us reach a Christian, we can do that for less than 40 cents a believer in key states. Um, and we want to help reach those Christians, not just for this election, but every election for the rest of their life, because uh, we want to help them vote in every election and to see God move in their life. So with that, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Ken, so much. Uh, thank you for all your work at Waterstone and Promise Keepers. And we so appreciate you. And we're believing for a great awakening. Will you pray us out, brother? Mm, absolutely. Father, I just, uh, I pray for this election that's coming up. It's so drastically important. It's uh, not just about the social issues, but even about people who, we're talking about CBDCs and trying to replace our currency. It seems like the left is taking over in every which way. Lord, we need wisdom. And I pray that 78% of people voted for Republicans in the last presidential election, but only 78% uh, of evangelicals, but only a third of evangelicals voted. And God, I pray that you would convict them to get out and to move and be active and understand the battle that we're in. Lord, it's 
It's that people don't even understand the problem that we're in. It's it's not that they don't see the solution. It's that they don't understand the problem. God, I pray that you would give our leaders the words to communicate that people would be able to hear. We would see the evil of a of an administration that declared Easter to be Trans Recognition Day, Lord. Our hearts just bleed and they mourn the state of our country. But yet, Lord, we know that we are your hands and feet. So we pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that would you, you would use us, you would give us the wisdom and the ambition that we need and the confidence to go out and you would shut the, the words of Satan, shut our ears to his words, telling us that it's too late, that we can't do it. God, you said the one who perseveres will get the crown. And let us be those people who persevere all the way to the end, knowing that when we get done, you'll say, I, I know son or daughter, you did everything you could to rescue America. Yes. Thank you. And God, let us be those people in your name. Amen. 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 We'll see you guys back next week as we continue this series on stewarding the great awakening. We love you guys. Thank you so much for joining us for this incredible podcast. What in the time we've had. We love you so much. We love being in your life. Have you subscribed? Have you shared this with your family and friends? Please subscribe on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Rumble, wherever you get your audio or video pods. We need your help. This mission is undergirded by individuals just like you that support this ministry monthly, annually, and whenever you think about us to be able to reach over a million Christians in the next two years. That's our goal. We want to empower a million Christians around America to pray, vote, and engage regularly. Will you help us? We're here to do that, and we need your help. I want to say thank you to our partners at The Stream. What an incredible online publication put out by James Robinson and Life Outreach International. As we come together across denominational lines as believers to discern what God's saying about the news of the day and to hear from different viewpoints. Check out The Stream, make it your homepage, and get on their email list. This product is amazing. Also, our partners at Edify app, put out by Christian Post. This podcast app is a convergence of Bible teachers around America. We're excited to be a part of Edify app. Check out all their other podcasts. Thank you so much again for caring about this nation. We're here to help you pray, vote, and engage. We'll see you next week.